All right, and we have the catch box in the back. You're rocking the catch box, right? Okay, you get it ready to go. Okay, so what we're going to talk about are digital marketing trends that are happening now in uh, 2018. And as you can see on the stage here, we have a panel of experts that are going to be joining us today. And the fun thing about this is you are actually the panel of experts. So with that being said, I get to recruit at least three people to join me today. The good news is I already have one that has already volunteered. So Jante, would you please come to the stage? We uh, actually, if we could get the catch box, yeah, Jante in the house. You can have a seat up there. Thank you. This will be your mic. Awesome. So just to demonstrate to them, instead of introducing you like I normally would, just to demonstrate to them how this will work, okay. tell us a little bit about your business and who you are and where you're from. All right, so my name is Junte Delane, not Junte or Junte, but having a very unique name is beneficial in marketing because if you Google search me, I'm gonna be the first person to pop up, <laughs> all right? Um, so I wear many different hats. Uh, one, as a senior digital brand manager for the University of Southern California. I'm pretty sure you guys may know of a small private university across town. Uh, also, I am the founder of Digital Branding Institute, which is a resource for all things digital branding, and I'm the CEO of Digital Delane, which is a digital branding agency. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. So have a seat. And so now I get to recruit two other panelists from the audience. Now, if you're here and your boss paid for you to be here, you might want to think about this because this is streaming live as we speak to thousands of people. We have uh, LinkedIn groups where we distribute this out to about 65,000 people in digital marketing. And then we have thousands and thousands and thousands on the email list. As you can imagine, over five years, we have developed lots and lots of email addresses. So when we send this out, this is also going to be featured on our website. So to go back to your boss, your boss would love it if you come up and give them free publicity for today. So, oh yeah, we already got one. You're on. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> Hello, Janie, have a seat. Tell us about your company, tell us about you, and then tell us about your company, please. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Janie Ho. Um, I'm a professor of social media. Hold, you gotta hold the catch box. There you go, yeah. Is this a mic? Yeah, it's a mic, it's live. I wasn't here yesterday, so. Hi everyone, I'm Janie Ho, I'm from New York City. I, um, I'm a professor of social media at Fashion Institute of Technology, which is uh, a SUNY in New York City and I was an analyst at LinkedIn, and before that I was a journalist at CBS News, New York Magazine, and GQ. So, lots of different things. Awesome, so we got USC in the house, owner of an agency, we got Fashion Institute, CBS, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I mean, just see how this happens. Oh, and I don't even have to ask for one more. We already have him. And just so you know, in my recruiting bag of tricks, my last trick is that I give whoever volunteers 10 extra entries to wow. win the Samsung smartwatch. So you get 10 extra entries towards winning the Samsung smartwatch just by sitting on the you stage. You told the most exciting thing at the yeah, last yeah. <laughs> So yeah, hi everyone, this is Akhil Desai. Uh, I work with an organization called eDynamic uh, into digital technologies. So my background, I'm a technologist by heart. Started okay, great. long way, one and a half decades ago as a technologist, as a developer. Uh, right now, so I had background in cloud, in security, digital marketing technologies, automation, uh, content management systems. Uh, uh, before joining this, I had worked with organizations like IBM, Repros, Infosys of the world. I, uh, uh, and yeah, I'm very excited about the conference. Awesome. So have a seat on the stage. And what's really cool about this, at every event that I do this, we get the perfect panel every single time. So, I mean, if you think about your background, your background, and then we brought in the technology and the IT background. So all of that's going to play into the top digital marketing trends for 2018. So if there's someone else who would really love to be up here, we can make that happen. Okay, we're good to get, get going? Okay, I didn't want you to miss out. You would love to be up here? Really? Come on down. Have a seat. We do have a nice chair. Oh, this is fun. 
Someone took it away. Okay. All right. You're low maintenance. That's good. So tell us who you are and tell us about your business. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Bays. I don't have a business currently. I just graduated university. Um, Which university? Bowling Green State in Ohio. Okay. And moved to Southern California about five months ago to pursue digital marketing. Um, I've ran a few businesses through college created a subscription box company and ran an iPhone screen repair business, uh, which kind of helped pay the bills. So Absolutely. Here we are, just trying to learn more as much as possible. Okay, so you guys got to hold it, hold it close, uh, but you ran an online subscription company, mm -hmm. is that right? Subscri subscription box company for care packages. Okay, great. So we have the perfect panelist as we go into the digital trends for 2018. So quick, uh, quick thing from me, quick note from me is basically, if we look at the top trends, we're going to analyze probably about eight to ten trends uh, this morning during this hour. But as you know, there's 20, 50, 100 others that could be added to this list. So I think the challenge of all of us is, you know, we're always trying to be unique. So how can we be unique when we have all of these new tools that are flying at us and it's like, do we use all of them? Do we use some of them? So which do we use and how do we take all of this? and be unique while trying to integrate all of this advanced technology. I think that's the challenge to kind of keep in mind as we go through this. And first of all, I think the first thing for us to recognize uh, in 2018 is that we are, we are the distribution company. Uh, we, are the, we are the broadcast company ourselves. And a lot of people still haven't gotten that yet. Because if you think about it, we select the audience, we go out and grab the audience, we have the production. A lot of you are now working in production and you never thought you would be in production as far as producing content. Talent. Some of you are agency owners. Um, some of you are agency account executives, but you're now the talent in some of this content. And of course, the distribution. We choose the distribution channels. We own the distribution channels. And we select the distribution channels. And then monetization, we're all trying to monetize what's happening and what we're distributing for our clients or for ourselves. And then last measurement, we're all measuring that audience that we're reaching consistently. I mean, that's typically a broadcast company. So we don't really think of ourselves like that. So if you're a, if you're a business owner, you're a broadcast company. So I'm curious to go to our panel to talk about how you have decided or how you've realized that now you found yourself broadcasting or playing one of these roles. All right, I guess I'll speak to that. Um, I think um, your point about being a broadcast company is interesting now because in order for you to truly exceed in your market, you're gonna have to become a brand and that brand creates content and communications with its target audience. Uh, and so when you consider yourself a broadcast company, it puts you in the mind frame to create more content and content that's obviously relevant and engaging, right? And so I think that's the first step is having that mental mindset of, okay, yes, we are a company, organization, a brand, but we are also a broadcast company and then set your uh, strategic objectives accordingly. Yep, yep, good idea. So anyone else wanna add to that? Oh yeah. Sure, I, I love to touch about measurement. That's my favorite. I measurement, of course. Yeah, I used to run my own advanced analytics company for it. So uh, really, uh, when we talk about measurement, about data, that's, that's probably one of the most critical aspects I see today. Uh, we all talk about content, a lot of content. So uh, one, one uh, issue that we see in, in all, uh, uh, all, all of us, we really uh, have got created such an ocean of content by now the end customers, the end clients, uh, when they really end up at our digital assets, whether it's a website or anything else or social network, it's like an ocean of content uh, that they, and, and we expect them to really dip them in deep inside and somehow find what they are looking for. So mm -hmm. it's really important to measure what exactly are they finding exciting about our content. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of tools uh, which, which can help us do it. So a lot of us talk about heat maps within our website, for example. Mm -hmm. So we need, really need to know what content is what the uh, end visitors want to look at, mm -hmm. what is that they are finding useful for them. And accordingly, we have to uh, uh, design our content strategy going forward. Awesome. And I'm going to let you dive into that with one of our other topics coming up. But so how many of you, again, have found yourself 
you didn't think you were going to be in content or be a talent behind the, the screen um, for some of this content. I saw that you smiled when I said that. Is that you? Okay. Anyone kind of found themselves in that position recently? All right, it's early, I know, but, you know, don't make me go random and start throwing this thing around. So, okay, so we'll move on to the second uh, on our list, mastering micro moments. Okay, so how many of you in here have a smartwatch? Okay, so you all get to speak this morning. No, I'm just kidding. So obviously here we're talking about smartwatches and moving towards being able to capture people in these micro moments as they're wearing these watches. And so when we were in New York, you know, obviously you're walking constantly and we ran into this mall, walked into this mall and here's this huge display. And I had to take a picture of it because it was very relevant to, uh, to the discussion because if you notice, when we think of smartwatches, we all think of what? Apple, Samsung, right? But in the smartwatch industry, you can see Fossil is there, LG, Garmin is there, um, obviously Samsung, Tag Heuer um, actually launched their first uh, smartwatch. Uh, how many of you enjoy some Louis Vuitton? Come on, you like Louis Vuitton. Okay, Louis Vuitton has their own smartwatch. So I went into the Louis Vuitton store and just kind of, I like to do like, um, sample the salespeople. So I walked up to the counter, I looked at the Louis Vuitton smartwatch, and I'm like, so tell me what's, what's great about this watch. Tell me why someone would love this watch. And the first thing she says to me is, well, first of all, you get weather anytime you need it. And I was thinking, it's not really what I thought would be the first answer from Louis Vuitton. Um, so, and then she's like, well, and we also have our, our own app, so you can download that app, and there's a lot of different tools that you can utilize, but people really love the access to the, to the weather. So I took that back, and uh, I'll show you some data on that in just a few minutes, but look at the smartwatch uh, trend that's happening right now. So again, raise your hands if you have one right now, and hold them up. Now raise your hands if someone in your household has a smartwatch. Okay, so you can see in this room, literally, that how that trend is, is definitely moving up. And what's interesting also when we talk about micro moments, just as I left this mall, I'm leaving and I check my email on my smartwatch and I printed it actually from my mobile device, but literally walking near Nordstrom's rack store initiated an email to my watch and to my smartphone. So how many of you are using beacon technology or this type of technology to grab the, the audience as they're literally walking through or past your clients? Back here. So can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Because we typically get this either from consumers, retail, or even the service industry. All you gotta do is watch out for the coffee. Um, yeah, actually we just started doing that sort of thing probably within the last year and a half. Um, we've been using geofences to trigger, I work for a theater company um, that does live production. Sure. So when people come within the geofence, which is surrounding the venue, they get parking information, um, they get like any, any kind of special events that might be happening in the lobby. Um, we have a thing called Audience Works, which is kind of like a creative um, activity that our audience members can um, join in on uh, and so it kind of explains what audience works is and invites them to join so depending on what the show is and what offers are available um, we kind of yeah blast so that not up. so answering frequently asked questions um, showing promotions showing what's coming up at the theater mm -hmm. and then also inviting them into what sounds like almost like your own little social network world called audio works yeah right mm -hmm. that's really cool really great use of micro moments. Uh, anyone else using this? Anyone in the service industry using this? Because I had a really good one uh, about this at the last session. So in the service industry, let's, let's just say it's a very large lawn maintenance company. And the way they've used micro moments and some of the other trends that we're talking about is when they go out on a service call, they automatically get pinged that there's either a prospect or a brand new customer that's within three houses or five houses 
of that service call. So they've now asked the service technician to not only handle that service call, but take five minutes and just go next door and just shake hands, introduce yourself, or leave something on the, on the door. So they're using the service driver now to help with the brand perception through customer service and then also to extend sales. And I thought that was a really great way of using that, uh, that technology. And I've lost my clicker. Here it is. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, so also when we're talking about micro moments, how many of you are aware of, in the search business, uh, this new concept that's happening now? It's beta testing right now with Google. So what's able to happen here is, let's say that you type in, you want some dark blue chukkas on Google. And as you can see, there's a million different results, but the results that you pay the most attention to are right there at the top of the screen. And this is on a mobile device where you can literally scroll and look at all the different blue chukkas that you want, you see the one that you like, you can see that it's Timberland, oh, I like that brand, or Ted Baker, I like that brand, or I like that price. And now you're gonna see a buy now button. So for those of you who have entered your credit card information into your new Apple phone, you click that buy now button, takes a shot of your face, approves the order, and you've got blue chuckas on the way to your house. So you don't even visit the website. You don't even have to look at the reviews. I mean, if that's good enough for you, click buy now and it's on the way. So really good use of just quick, instantaneous marketing and buy now moments. So now let's move on into the visual side of things. So we're moving now, as you know, from promoting, aside from in the instance that I just showed you here, but for the most part, we're moving into a more visual space where we no longer promote our products like this, but we're showing our products more like that, where we're actually showing the emotional connection to our product and the problem solving and using video to show that our products are solving problems and real needs. So I'd like to hear you guys talk about uh, maybe how you're using content to get that more emotional connection um, and to solve problems. So I teach um, freshman photographers, uh, fashion photographers, who are, who are amazing photographers. I mean, some of them are interviewing to be art directors at Michael Kors at 19, 20 years old. Um, so what I've learned is that you have to stop getting ready to get ready. It's really difficult to produce video because if you don't think it's up to par, but um, professional video, because I came from CBS News, they would be horrified at the video quality, but the authentic video is really the only one that works, especially for stories and live. So you have to just stop getting ready to get ready and just start publishing yourself on stories, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook Live. And if you do Facebook Live, we do it, you have to drop it at same day of every week and make it like an actual TV show. And um, if oh, it looks- Did you just say almost like your own TV show? Yeah. So, so we I are think, the broadcast company? And it has to drop the same day every week. So that way you can promote it with like a Canva flyer across all your social media for the date, the time, the host, and the different guests that you're going to have. And then um, if it looks close to being polished, it, people actually don't want that. So that's your chance to be very authentic. Start drawing and putting stickers and sticker hashtags on all your stories. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's gonna connect with people with live. And that's the highest in the algorithm also. So what is your Twitter hashtag? Oh, uh, my Twitter handle? Yes. Oh, uh, at- I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Janie Ho, J-A-N as in Nancy, I-E-H-O. So seven letters, very easy, 16. So Janie Ho 16. Janie Ho 16. Thank you so much. Stop preparing to get prepared. No, stop getting ready to get ready. Stop just, getting just, ready to get ready. Just put yourself on video. Yes, I like that. Now, obviously, I know we have some people that are saying, oh my gosh, I can't do anything that's not highly produced. And of course, there are instances where you may have a certain brand or, or company or maybe financial industry where it does need to be a little bit more polished. Um, or as you're getting your customers ready for that uh, more deep dive into your behind the scenes of your business. Um, very, very good. How many of you have started to use content or you've changed the way you're using content now? Talk to us about that. Yeah, I've, I've set up, wow. Uh, I've set up uh, regular meetings with my video production crew um, and it's, it's kind of in the same way that we would have an editorial schedule for 
articles previously. Now they're showing up at the office at least once a month. We've, we're forced to develop the muscle to develop the talk track and the script and what we want to talk about that month. And we're trying to just make it a regular routine and just part of everything we do. Um, so did I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but did I hear you say you're shifting uh, from the print to video? Is that what's happening? Not wholesale, but we're in incorporating more video into the mix Got overall. It. Okay. So you're noticing the, you, that you're having more meetings to, have, to create more video f versus the past. We're trying to be as conscientious about the content production side with video as we have with other forms of content in the past, and, and that, that forced regularity is, for us at least, what, what finally got us over the hump of being able to actually start doing it. Perfect. So forcing that regularity. And then we have uh, one other person here. I think it was one, okay, sure. Um, I work for a company that makes baby toys, teethers, yeah. cribs, um, high chairs, things like that. Um, and so for years, it's the picture of the smiling baby holding the toy with a blown out background on the package. And, and we've really, um, in the last few years, shifted that. Um, and in order to get real authentic moments, um, Yes, babies don't like having 10 cameras in their faces. Um, if you're a mom you, or dad, you may know. Um, so we've partnered um, with others to co-create content, influencers, people with their own social media channels, to give them products. And uh, they give us the high-res um, pictures back. And we've been using those in our campaigns, these really authentic moments of mom dragging an entertainer into a, sh in a bathroom so she can take a shower. And we've got this kid playing by the sink and is an entertainer. And, and those kind of... Uh, posts are going much, much further than the polished, blown out background studio shots. Um, right. To the point where we've invited people to just share their stories. Um, we're trying to create a wow moment right now with uh, disability advocacy, making sure all of our packaging have children with Down syndrome and things like that represented, and inviting those parents who come to our shoots to share their stories in those iPhone videos that we share online, and they're um, some of our most popular content. Excellent example. Uh, of you know showing I mean when mom's scrolling through and she sees that blown out photo I mean it's it's somewhat relatable because it's it is a kid but when she sees another mom dragging her kid to like like you say and then they're sitting down and actually enjoying the toy much more relatable to the audience and then I think we had someone over here yes right here I have a little corner bar that's a client, and we didn't know if we were going to be able to do anything with them because it's a bar. Yeah. But we have 30 to 50,000 people interacting on their Facebook page every day. Wow. It's crazy. And we, we do humor. Um, we just do everything. Like, we'll go down and record everything that a drunk says and then make up these little things. It is hysterical, and people just go nuts over it. And it's, so, so you're creating online the perception of a fun great place to hang out yep yep yeah. and we have you know celebrities when they're in town they all hit, hit it up and it's just crazy yeah but it works yeah so. so just as my example I have a boat dealer um, who had trouble producing content uh, with their budget and so I said hey let's let all these great people on the lake produce our content so we just post contests and we're like, uh, give us the hashtag uh, Lake Life or send in your videos to be featured on our page. And oh my goodness, like the best content ever. Kids out there, you know, tubing, skiing, you know, just having the best moments ever. All different ages, uh, cultures, demographics. It, it worked out beautifully. Anyone else? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to add on a couple points. I see you guys taking notes down here. So just for added value, a couple of things that I would recommend is one, to make sure that you upload videos to Facebook, for example, native, natively. It's very important because you're going to get more organic reach that way. And two is start doing more live streams. So if you have a piece of content that you're promoting, let's say a latest blog post, you can create a live stream talking about that blog post, right? Um, and you also can start to repurpose that video as well. So taking that video, breaking it down into bite-sized pieces where you're able to put, let's say for example, on Instagram, that's one minute clips of that particular video. Another, another strategy would be if you have a YouTube channel and you are promoting that, that YouTube video on the channel to your email list, what I would do is send them directly to that video instead of sending them to your website. And here's the reason why. 
because the more immediate interaction that you get on that video, the more organic reach you're gonna have. So your video could end up being recommended by YouTube uh, for, uh, uh, on the side of similar videos as well, right? So those are some strategies to, uh, to employ when you have video content to upload it natively on uh, Facebook. And if you have YouTube content, and you're sending out video uh, announcements on your email list, make sure you send those people directly to that video page itself so that you can get more organic reach through YouTube. Mm -hmm. very quick yeah, sure. Sorry. And we started doing that as well, and we found that also it helped our SEO, uh, helps so many things, but we were embedding the video in our emails, and what we found is by placing the play button there and then just typing, you know, click here to watch the video, then they click and then go to our YouTube channel where they can watch the video. It w everything worked better together. Yep. So. And one quick note is uh, if you don't like what the idea of putting yourself on video because you see yourself differently, you hear yourself differently when you see yourself on video, it's difficult to see. Um, you can actually just pull the audio. Um, there's a lot of free tools, just Google the free tools to, to pull the audio and do video production and pre creating social posts. Um, so you could just get the audio. But everyone has a podcast now. You can use Anchor, which is free, or you could just you could also upload it on SoundCloud for free. Um, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but oh, sorry. we're having I'm having trouble hearing her. Are you? It might just be me. Okay, and um, you just had some really good stuff there. So can you kind of back up a little bit? Um, can you say it again. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So so hold it a little bit closer if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. sorry. Can you hear me now? So you think you're loud, but you're not. Really? Yeah. I, I'm so loud to myself. Okay, so if you don't like to see yourself on video, which I don't. Um, you can actually just pull the audio from it and, and chop it up and make it into a podcast, which everyone has now. It's, it's easier to distribute. People love vo voice technology because they're so used, like Alexa and all the voice technology is like the next big thing, especially when they're commuting. Um, it's, just easy. it's just easier. So distribution across all your social media can be easy if you are self-conscious. So you want to pull the audio, and you can just Google the free tools to pull the audio off the video. So you want to have it as a YouTube, but you can also make it, you can just pull it for free. You can use Anchor, a lot of people use that. You can also use SoundCloud, and that's up to like three hours, and chop it up to like 10 minute podcast, just to get started, to stop getting ready to get ready. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just right back, uh, what was the source you mentioned other than SoundCloud? Just I uh, want to make SoundCloud sure. SoundCloud is very popular. Uh, it's freemium, but you can also get three hours for free, I think. So you could just chop it up to 10 minutes and then drop it. If you don't want to do it very often, just get started. Do it like once a month or every other week, but have a set schedule. Like I'm going to drop every other Tuesday 10 minute podcast just to get started. And, and the other resource. And then Anchor. Anchor. Also. Anchor is free, but if you just Google free podcast tools, you can have your video and double task it to make it a podcast. Um, but Anchor is very popular for that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I have another. He, he had another sorry. source. Oh, no, I was, I was saying it's, it's, ah, it's anchor.fm, I believe. Anchor.fm? Okay. Yeah, I have another example. So for our case, our target uh, potential customers are all marketeers. For them, technology is always like a non-sexy, non-cool kind of stuff. So uh, we used to depend a lot on blogs. Uh, had a lot of these technology blogs written, but often we find that not many people used to visit and read the blogs. So what we started, we just added, uh, say, short videos or podcast, which will give a summary of what that blog is about. That really helped. It's like the traffic suddenly increased the. Uh, more uh, potential customers used to visit, hear that, and then uh, even they used to, uh, the people who were now coming to the blogs, they were more qualified for us in terms of talking conversion. So what we saw as an end objective, the conversion increase. So when we uh, tracked that uh, traffic which was coming to the blogs now, uh, they were really the people who were interested in that. This is a trend that I'm hearing at every, I mean, I've spoken at probably, I don't know, six of the different con uh, different conferences, and that is that comes out at every single conference is that the people they pull into the blogs are much more quality uh, visitors, and I mean we keep hearing about that. Okay, so voice. Um, how many of you have Alexa in your home or Google? Okay, so it looks almost like the smartwatch, right? Um, so 
here's what brought me back when we're thinking about micro moments. This is what brought me back to uh, Louis Vuitton because for me, when she led with that, I was thinking, really, weather is the sexiest pitch that you have for the watch? Because for me, it was, it, it didn't make sense, honestly. I mean, it's a five, six thousand dollar watch, and to me, it wasn't, weather was not the big deal. So then I started doing some research. What's the weather today has grown 160% over the past two years, and I think voice is leading this. And how many of you use voice to find out what the weather is before you start your day? So everybody's nodding, everybody's raising their hands. So I guess I'm the only person that's not doing that. But back to voice, by 2020, and you know, stats are stats, but by 2020, 50% of all searches will likely be voice searches. And so many of us, I find, have not even started to get our business into this segment. And what I also find that's interesting is, well, these are some, nope, that's the other one. So what I find that's interesting about this is this is also the segment where we're most behind all types of technology that we use in marketing. 70% of our consumers want more voice. They want more ability to use voice. They want to be able to ask Alexa to do more. They want to be able to ask Google to do more. And yet we're not even in that space, a lot of us. We're not even getting our clients into that space. But many are. And I'm sure you have some ideas on that. So I want you to think about if you've started integrating your marketing into voice, we definitely need to hear from you. Definitely. So voice, uh, we, and, and, uh, we had a presentation yesterday where uh, Whitman, he spoke about uh, uh, how uh, even Google has modified with the latest Hummingbird uh, 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 algorithm. Yeah, so, so the, the real uh, thing is everyone is moving towards the intent rather than the keywords and the text which is written. So voice will be a big driver towards that intent. So the idea is how well uh, uh, Google uses machines to read it. In actual, all of us are human beings. So what we are interested in is something, what is the intent of that content? So slowly and slowly, the entire philosophy behind voice and what Google has realized, it's the intent of that content. So rather than just putting keywords and throwing out words uh, to the end audience, it, it's all about are they really getting what they were looking for? So that's where the entire thing will get driven for. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. How about you? Okay, so can you speak to us about how you're incorporating voice or? Um, well, I will just say one quick takeaway that I got when I went to an actual Google Voice at Google New York City um, panel is that Google um, Voice is actually an actual person in the room. So it's not as rude as, say, being on your phone and, say, ordering a pizza for the room because they don't know what you're doing. You're actually saying, OK, Google, order a pizza. There's someone in the room. So you're not interrupting your interaction and being rude with people. So that's something that you should consider when you're creating content is that it's, not, it's actually not taking away from sitting with someone. They're actually someone sitting there. Um, the other thing is the frustration. When, when something doesn't work on your phone or on your computer, it's kind of expected, but it's really frustrating when voice doesn't work. It's like, okay, Alexa, turn up the volume and like turn it up or something, like the yes. song comes on. So those are the two major frustrations. And the other way to think about it is that there's someone in the room and it's an opportunity to not be rude and break that. Uh, that social norm that everyone's used to is, of being rude in conversations now. It's very good. Reminds me of my love-hate relationship with Siri. <laughs> Come on, Siri, get it right. So, absolutely, And but I'm curious first if anyone in the room is working in SEO and can talk to us about how they're using, uh, how they're changing their tags for voice in SEO. Anyone? Ah, no SEO experts in the room? Okay, so sure. Was it, you had a question? Okay. I just wondered if it's for, for anyone who is using voice, um, I had two questions. Uh, you had the stat up there that talked about the, the increase in weather searches. So when we look at 50% of all searches being on voice, is there a, a content shift where voice has a certain type of, of search, whether maybe ordering your pizza, but other searches are slower to move to voice, or do we feel that stat is 
across the board. Some people are just adopting voice and using it as a replacement for their other tech um, and, and doing moving all their search that way. And the second question I had is what is the current or expected balance and interplay between SEO and paid on voice? So um, I've seen a lot about improving your SEO to get that zero position in voice. Mm -hmm. um, but I know Google and Amazon want to make money. Um, and uh, and I, I pay a lot of money into, to search for Google and AMS. So what is the, the balance there between that native organic result in the zero mark versus paying to be the pizza company that comes up when somebody asks to order pizza? Very good question. A lot, there's several ways to unwrap that, that question. Did you want to talk about that? Okay. Just give a, a, a new dimension to, to your question. I know I might not be answering it exactly, but Google, Amazon, and even you won't believe companies like MasterCard and Ford, all of uh, these companies, they're working on what they call as the data pool, or, or uh, essentially the, the entire idea behind this is uh, end of the day, they believe they will be data companies rather than product companies. So I'll give you an example, say MasterCard. They tied up with LG to fit in their chips inside the washing machines going to come up. So what they okay? Do, I'm sorry. To f they place their chips and chips inside the washing machines, the the washers and dryers, and and what they are going to do? They are going to monitor the behavior for each of the user for that machine. So they will know your behavior. What's the kind of load you use on that machine? What type of clothes? What type of temperature do you use? And end of the day, the entire objective is once they get that kind of data, they'll start uh, putting up the recommendations around, say, what kind of washing detergent you need to use. So uh, it's, it's the, all these companies, the, and similarly, I, I was talking to uh, Ford. They, they have GPS systems inside the cars, so they actually uh, store the entire history as to which places you spend, where do you park your car, say, um, uh, and based on that, they, can, they have algorithms to predict uh, whether you have pets, what kind of uh, veterinary uh, doctors do you visit, and so on. So all this, what, uh, it's like a data web which is getting created around us, and all these companies, uh, see these technologies like voice, end of the day, it's nothing but machine learning. So machines are trying to learn about us as end consumers. So the end objective is more and more of our data when it reaches to these machines. That's when this entire web of data will start pulling out details and uh, sort of feeding up the values by itself. So they will start predicting what do we want as next action. So when we are going to buy, when we are going to consume anything, the machines itself will start predicting, yeah, uh, Based this is on what. Your past. Exactly, yes. exactly. So this is like a, a web which is getting created, and all of our data that we are uh, getting uh, used with these uh, technologies, it's it's going right. to like come back to us in terms of what preferences the marketers can use. Right. right. So if you think about it, they already have the data. You know, they just like when we use uh, GPS fencing or GPS uh, display banner ads. You know, we already know if that person's visiting a dog groomer every day or every not every day, hopefully, but like every few weeks, and which grocery store they shop at, which place they buy their gas. That data is already there. So just I think the challenge is from the data side is helping the marketers use that data in a voice situation. I just want to add uh, some more context to that um, answer as well, and I'll try to be as concise as possible, but I think there's two things that you'd have to consider. One is consumer behavior, and the other is becoming first to market, right? And so obviously we know that consumers want instant gratification, right? So when you look at the current Google search, the traditional Google search, you'll notice that Google's starting to autofill some of their potential search queries, right, to make things quicker. Search is going the same route, right? So no matter what those consumers are searching for, we know in general they're wanting their um, search responses quickly, no matter what they're searching for through voice, right? Um, and the second is really becoming first to market. So we probably all remember back in the day when we had Facebook pages, we would post things on Facebook, and everyone following us would get our posts, right? <laughs> now it's dwindled down to pretty much zero. You have to pay to play. So that's the same route that I think Google is going as well, right? They're opening up the voice search market. They want to make sure that they have consumer adoption. And so once that happens, then they're going to start putting out uh, uh, play, paid platforms on their search platform. 
terms, right? And so I think it's very important to consider that as marketers. We will have some advantage being come, uh, becoming first to market, right? And so right now, you should wrap your head around what can my brand do within search because you potentially could be leveraging more reach for your audience at either zero or a, a nominal cost for now. Sure, absolutely. My, I would be very interested in seeing um, how Alexa can let companies start monetizing skills when they start to, because I don't think they're allowing companies to monetize skills yet. So tens of thousands of companies are putting as much fervor and excitement around creating skills as they did in creating YouTube videos in 2005. So you can wake up to Gary Vaynerchuk's voice and his mantras, and that's a skill. And he's putting a lot of time creating special content just for Alexa skills. Mm -hmm. But they're not, Alexa, um, Amazon is not letting one, anyone monetize that yet. So that's a very interesting route in terms of search and AI in the voice area. Yeah, and back to kind of wrap up your question uh, on the paid and unpaid. I mean, I know at our company, um, we still understand that Google is going to serve uh, either way the most relevant, you know, ads. So on the organic side, I know, and I can't tell you how we're doing it, but my SEO person, if he were here, he could talk about it. But there are tags and different, different ways that we're tagging uh, content through SEO. Um, and reaching out to Alexa and telling Alexa, you know, when, and, and we're tagging it as, you know, Alexa, find me whatever, or get me this. So it's changed the way we've set up our keywords and our tags, and we are linked to Alexa uh, so that there is that relationship there. And hopefully you'll have someone that talks about search a little later today. Definitely ask that question because that's something easy to do, um, and you can start adopting that right now uh, with search or with voice. So when we think of going live, a lot of us think of, you know, Facebook, but obviously we have Ustream, we have Livestream, we have Twitch, we have <laughs> all of the above. I mean, everything is about live video, right? And so, seven, there's my slide that I needed a few minutes ago. So um, when, we, when we think about live video, um, you know, you, you had a really good point on that, about it not being polished and not being... Um, as heavily produced and doing it uh, consistently each week. So I'm interested to hear any of your thoughts or any of your uh, new content that you're streaming that's live and how, how that's changing your business. Okay, so I'm, I'm like Heisman here. <laughs> All right, good catch. All right, so I used to work in marketing back in the day for over 20 years and now I'm an educator and as a professor at a college um, in Nevada, what I've started to do is to structure my classroom uh, using live feed, um, asking my students to do the same in discussions. And it's really um, gone a long way in um, enhancing the content in the classroom and opening minds to maybe older students who are not savvy with these types of tools. And especially in marketing classes, it's really kind of um, bringing the classroom more uh, in a 3D format, for example. Um, so whether it be using Twitter or uh, Facebook Live, um, of course you have some FERPA issues that you have to be um, cognizant of, but I think that um, you know, really thinking about ways that you can use what we've been talking about this morning um, in education is really going to revolutionize, I think, the way that we uh, teach, and um, it will give us more of an ability to reach learners of different learning style preferences. Yeah, do you have an example of how you've used a live scenario in a class or how you've seen it used? Well, I uh, live in Las Vegas, so of course in a marketing class, um, I would go down to the strip and I would um, access some of my friends who are uh, directors, VPs, et cetera, and I would just uh, on the fly conduct um, an interview with them about a specific concept or topic that we're talking about for the coming week. And then I would post it with closed caption on my learning management system. So um, those uh, students who have disabilities who uh, need that, it's all ADA compliant. And sure. so these are all tools that I think many of my colleagues are not currently using in the classroom because we've, we're so used to that lecture, I will talk and you will listen mentality. But now we're, I'm trying to um, demonstrate the value of maybe bringing some of the things that are used in a corporate environment into the land of education so that we can then uh, bring people out into exposing them to 
whether they're entrepreneurs or whether they're going to become marketeers at some, in some way, shape, or form, um, to use tools that are being used in corporate. I love that. In Houston, we actually had an educator who talked about incorporating live as well. And what's great there is you get not only that, th as, as you said, that 3D experience of being there in the moment at that time and being able to talk in a live setting, but then you can also go back instead of, you know, the traditional note taking, you can go back and watch it and you get another perspective and you get, you know, capture other information and content. Anyone else uh, has seen uh, live video impact your business? or willing to talk about it, I guess is the better question, right? So, okay, absolutely. Two quick uh, best practices. Um, for one, one thing, when you start posting like the jabs that Gary Vaynerchuk would say, so you start posting these day in the life or these non-salesy uh, live content and even regular posts, they, the algorithm takes into consideration how many people are engaging with that so that when you do your sales posts or your sales live or your sales story, you're already high in the algorithm. So that's why you want to get a little consistent in doing these non salesy posts. But just as content best practices as a yeah. host, um, you want to remember to keep reiterating what the general topic is because people are joining throughout your live. And then you want to make sure to keep calling people out as they're joining and where they're from and then taking their questions live as you're going because I see a lot of lives just talking one way because that's the point of the live. The other thing is you can also combine it with a Twitter chat, which is really effective. So you want to schedule your Twitter chat and make a, a promo, like a free flyer on Canva. And you can also, back to um, the lady in the, in the back's um, comment about closed captioning, there are free, there's free software that will automatically use AI to close caption and add subtitles for you in okay. these lives and videos. Any uh, sources that you can recall I, that's free? I don't remember, but you can actually Google that. There's a lot of video editing software that will, for free, it's freemium, everything's freemium, um, that will do the closed captioning for you. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so if you do a Twitter chat and then say, okay, now go to our Facebook Live for different content, but we'll do a deeper dive. So you schedule both of those and create flyers for them, and you should do it consistently like a, like I'll say it's Wendy's, like when, Wednesday Wendy's, right. Twitter chat, Twitter, it's like you create that your own hashtag. You can also put the hashtags in your Instagram bio now and they're clickable, so that's good for search also. Mm -hmm. So all ways to promote these lives. Yep, and then I think it was interesting, uh, someone had mentioned FOMO in a question to me uh, yesterday. And so what we use in our email uh, funnels uh, is, you know, we're going live on Wednesday. Don't miss out on this information. And we push that a lot, like don't miss this. This is valuable information or here's how valuable it is. And then once we go live, then we send out that next video that says, hey, did you miss us? You know, you still have a chance to, to view this. We're going to keep this video up for the next 48 hours. And again, you can reach another audience that goes back that maybe didn't get a chance. But I love the point that you made about whether or not it's live, it still needs to be engaging content. And we're still talking about being engaging, even if it's in a live scenario, so that you're not just, you know, preaching to, to the audience, but they're actually pulled into the conversation. Um, any any add-ons to that as far as live? Okay, ready to move on? Okay. So uh, data-driven marketing, that's why I was kind of, uh, I was kind of like, we're going to get to you in just a minute. So uh, data-driven marketing, basically, how many of you uh, love KPIs? It's like your thing, you know? No. Oh, wow. I got one. <laughs> okay, so you may need to join in on this conversation, but, you know, we're, we're looking at all of this data constantly, and we have all the data in the world that we need or would want, but how are we using it? to drive marketing. So I'll tell two stories here, uh, two examples. All of us talk about uh, customer segmentation and then targeting our campaigns according to those segments. The future is not there, really. Um, all of us are, are used to these health monitors that we wear on our wrist or, and, and that keeps recording our habits, how much exercise we do, how much steps we walk and so on. I'm sure a lot of us must have used it. So. Uh, they are actually tying up with health insurers. So the health insurance companies, and I, I work with uh, two of them. They and I actually, love this, by the way. Sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, but I love this. This is good for society, I mean, for everyone. 
Yeah, so, so, so idea really for them is, uh, so if you've heard about in insurance, uh, in car insurance, there is concept of telematics that all of us uh, might have heard. Mm -hmm. But in health insurance, there are very few uh, areas that people can get. So what they said, rather than looking for direct data, let's see the health behavior. And that's when they started tying up with these health monitor companies. And now what they're doing, they're not talking about mass campaigns or saying, if you're this kind of person, this is. So they are actually targeting each person as an individual, talking about their health behavior, and according to it, uh, giving them uh, the kind of insurance products. So mm -hmm. I know for them, it's the, the nightmare is with their product teams, but that's where the marketing has really going to change uh, for those companies. Yes, and, and make us healthier. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so I'll give you a second example. Sure, sure. Um, it's about, so a lot of us, when we download uh, mobile apps, I'm sure a lot of us do it day in, day out. We download a lot of mobile apps. We see there are permissions that any app asks us before it gets downloaded. There's a permission which says read your SMS. I don't know how many of us have noted that down. So uh, we worked with one of such companies. So what they, So when you click it, these companies can actually read your SMS. And what they, they tracked is, is your, uh, see the most difficult data which is for any individual to get is, is the financial data, yep. which is the data that belongs to your bank, your banking account, your investments. So these app company found a way out. They started reading your SMS. And for that person, uh, we could derive the entire history of investment, how much is the credit in the bank, how much have they spent, which day, which month. And that data is utilized by the wealth management company to uh, find a suitable product for that individual. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll just leave it there it's with those examples. So a couple of points to add on to that. How many of you have done 23andMe or any of the cool like DNA stuff? Yes. And are you noticing that you're now being invited to participate in uh, different types of health studies? That are, that are related to you and you're getting certain emails or certain messages that you know this company knew something about my background or my DNA or my testing to, in order to send me this information. I think 23andMe and those types of companies are working with the health insurance companies and really going to revolutionize the healthcare industry. And then on the second uh, subject, Credit Karma, I think, in the financial business is one of the smartest companies to dive into our financial background better than anyone else has been able to do that in history. I mean, if, you, if you're using Credit Karma, they're recommending credit cards for you to use, they're recommending loan companies, and these companies best suit your background already. And then you apply through Credit Karma, which gives Credit Karma all of your content and all of your background so that they can continue to match these advertising companies or these financial institutions to you based on your financial background. So they've done a really good job with that. Sure, I can provide another uh, example. Um, and this is something that you guys can potentially apply you know, right when you get to back to work. So how many of you uh, offer customer service through your Twitter accounts for your organizations or brands? Okay, so one thing I would recommend is when creating content and utilizing data to create content, it's important to look at the questions that are coming in to your Twitter account, right? And so what I like to do is I like to group all of the uh, questions coming in to our client's Twitter account and then look for reoccurring keywords and themes, right? And once we find those recurring keywords and themes, then we create content based on those themes. Because oftentimes we have our business objectives and then we try to create content to meet our business objectives. But oftentimes we may be missing the mark with connecting with our consumers because the bottom line here is consumers really don't want to learn more about your business or your offering. They want to be helped. They want their challenge to be met, right? And so if you do more digging into the data that's coming in, in particular through Twitter, you'll be able to reveal these keywords and themes. And so what I like to do is I like to call this, you know, creating content that fills gaps because there could be a gap between your, your offering and your customer expectations, right? So you want to create content that fills that. So focus on uh, creating the content that meets their objectives even before your company objectives because naturally if you meet their objectives, your company objectives are going to be met. Very good. Okay, so any, any blockchain uh, experts in the room? 
Yeah, me neither. It's the area that I know the least about, but I can tell you that it's something that we've got to learn about because in 2018, we already have companies aggressively using blockchain technology anywhere from UPS Store to L.L. Bean uh, that are using this. So rather than try to explain this to you, because I would explain it as probably the most sophisticated spreadsheet that can't be tampered with, which is not really the best way to describe it, I did find a quick video that I'm going to share with you, and it will at least... For some of you who don't have a clue about blockchain, it's going to open your mind a little bit to how this could be used. Blockchains are incredibly popular nowadays. But what is a blockchain? How do they work? What problems do they solve? And how can they be used? Like the name indicates, a blockchain is a chain of blocks that contains information. This technique was originally described in 1991 by a group of researchers and was originally intended to timestamp digital documents so that it's not possible to backdate them or to tamper with them, almost like a notary. However, it went by mostly unused until it was adapted by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 to create the digital cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Now, a blockchain is a distributed ledger that is completely open to anyone. They have an interesting property. Once some data has been recorded inside a blockchain, it becomes very difficult to change it. So how does that work? Well, let's take a closer look at a block. Each block contains some data, the hash of the block, and the hash of the previous block. The data that is stored inside a block depends on the type of blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain, for example, stores the details about a transaction in here, such as the sender, receiver, and the amount of coins. A block also has a hash. You can compare a hash to a fingerprint. It identifies a block and all of its contents and it's always unique, just as a fingerprint. Once a block is created, its hash is being calculated. Changing something inside the block will cause the hash to change. So in other words, hashes are very useful when you want to detect changes to blocks. If the fingerprint of a block changes, it no longer is the same block. The third element inside each block is the hash of the previous block. And this effectively creates a chain of blocks and it's this technique that makes a blockchain so secure. Let's take an example. Here we have a chain of three blocks. As you can see, each block has a hash and the hash of the previous block. So block number three points to block number two and number two points to number one. Now the first block is a bit special. It cannot point to previous blocks because, well, it's the first one. We call this block the Genesis block. Now, let's say that you tamper with the second block. This causes the hash of the block to change as well. In turn, that will make block 3 and all following blocks invalid because they no longer store a valid hash of the previous block. So changing a single block will make all following blocks invalid. But using hashes is not enough to prevent tampering. Computers these days are very fast and can calculate hundreds of thousands of hashes per second. You could effectively tamper with a block and recalculate all the hashes of other blocks to make your blockchain valid again. So to mitigate this, blockchains have something that is called proof of work. It's a mechanism that slows down the creation of new blocks. In Bitcoin's case, it takes about 10 minutes to calculate the required proof of work and add a new block to the chain. This mechanism makes it very hard to tamper with the blocks because if you tamper with one block, you'll need to recalculate the proof of work for all the following blocks. So the security of a blockchain comes from its creative use of hashing and the proof of work mechanism. But there is one more way that blockchains secure themselves and that is by being distributed. Instead of using a central entity to manage the chain, blockchains use a peer-to-peer -peer network and everyone is allowed to join. When someone joins this network, he gets a full copy of the blockchain. The node can use this to verify that everything is still in order. Now, let's see what happens when someone creates a new block. That block is sent to everyone on the network. Each node then verifies the block to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. And if everything checks out, each node adds this block to their own blockchain. 
All the nodes in this network create consensus. They agree about what blocks are valid and which aren't. Blocks that are tampered with will be rejected by other nodes in the network. So to successfully tamper with a blockchain, you'll need to tamper with all the blocks on the chain, redo the proof of work for each block and take control of more than 50% of the peer-to-peer -peer network. Only then will your tampered block become accepted by everyone else. So this is almost impossible to do. Blockchains are also constantly evolving. One of the most recent developments is the creation of smart contracts. These contracts are simple programs that are stored on the blockchain and can be used to automatically exchange coins based on certain conditions. More on smart contracts in a later video. The creation of blockchain technology piqued a lot of people's interest. Soon others realized that this technology could be used for other things like storing medical records, creating a digital notary or even collecting taxes. So now you know what a blockchain is, how it works on a basic level. Okay, so I'm going to have to fast forward through this unfortunately, everyone awake. So I'm going to have to fast forward through about three minutes to wrap this up. But with blockchain technology, I just want to give you a real world example real quick. I've talked, with, uh, spoken with recently uh, VRBO excellent use of, of blockchain. Wyndham Worldwide is now already uh, uh, incorporating blockchain because they're the largest timeshare company, I think, in the world. And so think about timeshares. If you own a timeshare, you have to look in this book, you call customer service, I want to go to Florida, can I share my timeshare? That's going away. You're going to have an app where all of that exchange can happen on that peer-to-peer -peer network and it can't be tampered with. And so that's how, how they're using blockchain. Now, influencer marketing, I know we're all getting into influencer marketing, and I hate that I have to, to speed through this, but obviously, you know, macro, micro influencers, your large, your small influencers, uh, whether they have a few followers or not, or large followers can be beneficial depending on, on your type of business. And when I think of influencer marketing, a lot of people don't think about this, but who knows what this is? Any Fortnite players in the room? Yeah, come on, you can admit it, it's okay, everybody's into Fortnite. So by the way, Minecraft is now using blockchain technology to give kids a way to buy things and to purchase things online based on the skill level they've uh, acquired in the game. So no longer do they have to get your PayPal account or your credit card to do transactions online because they actually have gaming coins and actually currency that they can trade for items that they want to purchase. So yeah, this is a gamer. He's an influencer. How many of you have heard of Ninja? Okay, so uh, for a quick minute after this is over, you might want to get an autograph from my son, Alton Turnbow, who's cringing right now. My son beat Ninja on Fortnite. So if you know anything about that, that's a really big deal. He has 13 million subscribers. And my son is now getting sponsored by a sports drink. So when he goes live and plays Fortnite online, he gets anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 people who sit and watch him play a video game. So the sports drink company is now depositing money into his PayPal account, and they're placing their sports drink right in front of that screen so all of these visitors, these thousands of visitors that are watching him play can see that sports drink all during the game. We'll take him times 100, and they're paying you what, like 100 bucks a month for that? Um, take that times 100, look at what they're able to do, and how else can you reach him, that gamer, 15 years old, better than by placing it right there in front of his audience as he's playing that video game. So that's influencer marketing on a different level than any of us would have discussed probably today, because we're thinking celebrities and, and et cetera, but he's an influencer. Um, so yeah, that's Ninja, uh, 30 million views on one game. That's a game that I snapped off of Twitch, not YouTube, uh, not the other sites where people go live. That's just Twitch. One game had 30 million views. And his friend beat this guy's best friend, which is Drake. Anyone know Drake? The rapper? He likes to play Fortnite. And so they kind of team up together a lot. So then also we talk about rebalancing content, and that's the area that I can probably skip today because we've talked a lot about how we're rebalancing content through live, through emotional connections and things like that. 
So that's the easiest one to skip. And then also we've covered pretty much artificial intelligence. And it's important to remember that while we're being artificial or using artificial intent, intelligence, we've got to try to keep it as human as possible. And then I usually have time for questions at the end. Unfortunately, I don't today, but I do want to thank my panel for sure. Uh, again, log into the app and you can reach out to any of the panelists and ask questions um, anytime you want through the app and you can send me questions. It's a, it's a great tool to use. And that's it. Thank you so much right, for being a part of the panelists. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to Jeff and the panelists. Maybe you can take a seat.